Welcome to our soil testing video series, jointly presented by the Geotechnical Division of the HKIE and the Geotechnical Engineering Office of the CEDD. The production of this series is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors. In this video, we are going to show you how shear strength of a soil can be determined through the direct shear test. Shear strength of a soil is required in designs and assessments concerning stability such as slope stability, bearing capacity, and earth pressures. Shear strength of a soil can be expressed in terms of total stress such as undrained shear strength Cu. It can also be expressed in terms of effective stress such as apparent cohesion C- dash, and angle of shearing resistance Phi- dash, under the Mohr coulomb valley model. There are many ways to obtain information on the shear strength parameters of a soil. For example, laboratory test, field test, correlations with other soil parameters, and from local guidance documents and experience. In this video, we will focus only on the direct shear test using a shear box apparatus. Geospec 3 covers two types of direct shear box apparatus commonly used. A small shear box for testing specimens of either 60 mm square with a thickness of 20 mm or 100 mm square with a thickness of 44 mm, and a large shear box for testing specimens of 300 mm square with a thickness of 150 mm. As a designer, we need to ask ourselves which test to specify. There are three considerations in selecting a suitable direct shear test method. The first consideration is the grain size of the soil. Simply put, the small shear box is suitable for finer soils while the large shear box should be used for coarser soils. The second consideration is the type of sample obtained from the ground investigation. Are we going to test undisturbed or disturbed soil samples? Undisturbed samples for the direct shear test are typically prepared from block samples. The shear strength can be determined for any predetermined plane by trimming the block samples to prepare specimens at the correct orientation. For the start samples of compacted soils or remolded soils containing large particles up to about 25 mm, a large shear box is recommended. The last consideration is whether we need to know the coefficient of friction between a soil and a geo reinforcement. If yes, then a large shear box is required, with some modifications to the standard test procedures. Let's take a look at the apparatus for the shear box test. The shear box is a square container with a swan neck. The box can be divided horizontally into two halves. There is a loading cap for transferring vertical load to the soil specimen. Other essential elements include two dial gauges, a proving ring and lever arm system with hangers and weights for the application of vertical stress to the soil specimen, a motor system with gears to control the rate of shearing. The dial gauges measure the horizontal and vertical displacements during shearing. The proving ring measures the shear force. Since the area of the shear box is known, the shear stress can be calculated. The shear box restrains laterally a prism of soil for shearing along a predefined plane while a vertical stress is applied normal to that plane. The soil specimen should be soaked in water to make sure it is as saturated as possible. Then, the specimen is consolidated under a vertical stress specified by the designer until primary consolidation is completed. The specimen is then sheared at a rate of displacement that is low enough to prevent development of excess pore water pressure. Hence, we may assume the test is carried out under drained conditions. With this test, the drained shear strength of the soil in terms of effective stresses is obtained. Let us summarize here. As a designer, what do we need to specify for the shear box test? The first thing is the type of direct shear test, that is, a large or small shear box. If the small shear box is to be used, then, we need to specify whether a 44mm thick specimen or a 20mm specimen is to be prepared. Next, we need to specify the normal stresses to be applied in a test series. In this connection, the designer has to consider the relevant stress range in the project. On this, please refer to the guidance given in the video on triaxial test of this series. We also have to specify the minimum soaking time. Usually, a minimum soaking time of 12 hours is adequate for most completely decomposed granites. 
a longer soaking time for fine grain soils may be required. Let's now talk about the interpretation of test results and some observations on soil behavior under shear. Two important factors that govern the shear strength of a saturated soil are the stress level applied during shearing and the density of the soil. We first consider the effect of soil density. When a soil is sheared under the same normal stress, a dense sand or an overconsolidated clay will display a peak, which corresponds to the maximum shear stress and a relatively small horizontal displacement. On the contrary, a loose sand or a normally consolidated clay would give the largest shear stress at the end of the test, that is, a relatively large horizontal displacement. A dense soil tends to expand in volume during shearing, whereas a loose soil will contract with a reduction in volume. The technical term for this volume expansion in a soil under shear is dilation. For the same soil but with different densities, the graph as shown here shows you the volume change or density change during shearing of the dense and loose soils. Theoretically, near the end of the test, both soils will arrive at similar final density, which we call critical density or critical void ratio. Moreover, the larger the normal stress, the smaller is the critical void ratio. Next, we consider the effect of applied normal stress level. When the applied normal stress is not very large, for dense soil specimens having the same density, the peak shear stress would increase with an increase in the normal stress applied. Based on the peak shear stress, a set of shear strength parameters, namely the apparent cohesion C dash and angle of shearing resistance phi dash, can be derived. The shear strength of the soil can then be estimated from the Mohr Coulomb failure model. If we choose the shear stress at the end of shearing, when the soil's volume is almost constant under shear, we may be able to obtain the so-called critical state friction angle. The apparent cohesion is usually zero, and the shear strength of the soil at critical states may also be obtained from this equation. The above discussion is based on the assumption that the applied normal stress is not very large. The effect of large particle stress on the shear strength behavior of the soil can be seen from this graph. The dilation of the soil under shear will be suppressed. A dense soil will in fact behave like a loose soil under a high stress state. We can therefore conclude that, apart from other factors, the shear strength of a soil is critically dependent on the applied normal stress and soil density. We have already seen that dense soil under not very large vertical stress will dilate during shearing. The behavior of the dilation may be characterized by the dilatancy angle, which is related to the change in volumetric strain to the change in shear strain. In the direct shear test, this angle under a peak shear stress can be easily obtained by this equation. Hence, it can be calculated from the slope of the vertical and horizontal displacement curve at the point of peak shear stress. Depending on the dilatancy model we adopt, the peak friction angle, critical state friction angle, and dilatancy angle are interrelated. There are some famous dilatancy models in the literature, for example, the Coulomb's sawtooth friction model, Taylor's interlocking model, and Bolton's model. The peak strength envelope for a dense soil or an overconsolidated soil is usually curved because of soil dilation, except under large normal stresses where it will converge to the critical state strength envelope. The dilation zone is shown in this graph. In Hong Kong, it is a common practice to use a best fit straight line to obtain the apparent cohesion and angle of shearing resistance in terms of effective stress. The more column failure criterion using a constant C dash and phi dash is an idealization. The designer should be cautious in the selection of laboratory test data points corresponding to the project's relevant stress range, as the selection of an unrepresentative stress range could result in unrealistic estimation of the shear strength parameters. Although the direct shear test is a relatively simple test, it is not routinely used in geotechnical design in Hong Kong as there are a few limitations. For example, there is no provision for pore water pressure measurement, there is no control over drainage, the soil specimen is constrained to fail along a predetermined plane of shear, and the distribution of stresses along the shearing surface is not uniform. The shear box apparatus may be used for some special tests, although these tests are outside the scope of Geospec 3. For example, 
We may use it to obtain the shield strength of open rock joints. We may also use it to obtain the residual shear strength through a method called multi-reversal shear box test, where the same saw specimen is sheared three times under the same normal stress. Lastly, it can be used to determine the shear strength parameter of thin infill soils, such as kaolin infills formed in some relic joints of the parent saprolytic soils. This wraps up our video on the direct shear test using a shear box. We hope you have gained valuable insights on the theories, procedures, and applications of these tests. Join us in the next video as we explore another exciting topic in soil testing. Thank you for watching.